Can we handle the truth? Science forces us to face the truth, whether it's acid rain, mercury, climate change, but can we handle it? Well, we have no choice, do we? The web of life is being ripped apart and our very futures, all of our futures are at stake. Waking people up to science and the need for action starts at places like Hubbard Brook. My last visit here was in 2005 when I brought the then CEO of Walmart, Lee Scott, on a learning trip about climate change. This, it seemed, was a place where he could get the big, the big picture. I don't think there's many people around here who get accused of not seeing the forest for the trees. <laughs> the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study shows the vital importance of integrating scientific knowledge into societal action. That's what I'd like to talk to you about today. In our age of ephemera, the fleeting tweets, the 24-hour news cycle, the short-sighted corporations who can't see past their quarterly earnings report, what a refreshing thing it is to stand here amidst a half-century-old experiment. And what emerges from those 50 years, for me, are three learnings. First, that humans are changing the biogeochemistry of our Earth. Second, that scientific insight can lead to action. And third, when we communicate science to the public, we need to have the right tone if we're going to capture that middle and bring people along. First, let's talk about how humans are changing the planet. Humans now have the power, although we never asked for it, to change the very biogeochemistry of the Earth. An early example of this, as you've heard already, was acid rain, where Jean Likens, Herb Borman, and their colleagues documented acid rain right here, but also in the, throughout much of the Northeast, and tied it to sources in the Midwest. On a personal note, I'd like to say that I've been privileged to have learned from both Jean and Herb. Uh, Jean, uh, a longtime trustee of the Environmental Defense Fund, chaired our science committee, started our practice of science days, and has had a huge imprint on our organization. Herb was a professor of mine as an undergrad, and I was impacted greatly by his lectures. I remember Jean in in the 1980s when you referred to them as the, the acid rain wars, the battles between industry and the environmentalists. And of course there were more wars to come over mercury pollution where Hubbard Brook Science again helped make the case that action was needed. On climate change the battles continue despite the mounting evidence that the widespread impacts are here and now. Already we know that the pH of the ocean has been changed. Species are shifting, including pests. Migratory animals are being separated from their food source due to shifting uh, seasons and timelines. A new IPCC assessment is coming out this year and next spring a national climate assessment overseen by Jerry Melillo, who did his PhD right here at, at Hubbard Brook under the supervision of Herb Borman, uh, will be published. One of the very first reports, by the way, about the impacts of climate change on the United States was drawn from data on Hubbard, from Hubbard Brook back in 1997. It was published by the Environmental Defense Fund focused on the forests here in the White Mountains and documented uh, impacts on maple syrup production, the ski industry, and also changing fall foliage. And recently, a paper published 
by Steve Hamburg documented that on the north slopes um, of hillsides here, uh, we're getting about 5% more precipitation than before, and that there's also been an increase in the intensity of storms. For any of you who've experienced the last three weeks around here, the last month, you know this, it's no surprise. In the last 30 days, Hubbard Brook has uh, received twice the historical average, maybe more significantly, there's been three days with rainfall above one inch and one day where it hit almost two inches. The key, of course, is that science must lead to action. And that's my second point, keep the faith, it can. On, earth, on acid rain and on mercury, indeed it has. On climate change, it's beginning to. On acid rain, it was the scientists' determination to do something about the problem that helped lead to the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments to cut sulfur dioxide pollution in half. Now, for those of us who long for a return for the bipartisan days of cooperation in Congress, I think it's important to note that in 1990, 89 senators voted for that Clean Air Act, only 11 opposed. And in the House, it was similar. We had 401 votes, uh, actually 401 votes in favor and just 21 against. Now, cutting sulfur in half was not enough to solve acid rain, but it was a good start. And the way it was achieved using cap and trade lent itself to subsequent ratcheting down, something that George W. Bush set about to do a decade later. Today, cap and trade is at the heart of China's seven pilot experiments to curb carbon pollution, as well as California's climate law, AB 32, as well as a number of programs in the EU and around the world. But back to acid rain, by last year, sulfur dioxide pollution from US power plants was down 80% from their 1990 levels. In addition to the ecological benefits, a recent analysis of uh, the cap and trade program by Schmollenzi and Stevens documented the massive human health benefits. Because um, sulfur dioxide, uh, much of it, turns into these tiny sulfate particles, and because we now know the human health impacts of those uh, are terrible, it turns out the benefits of the law outweigh the costs by more than 50 to 1. Now, nitrogen oxide pollution, also part of acid rain, has been much harder. We've made less progress. But EPA's cross-state air pollution rule and its proposed tier three emission standards for motor vehicles would help us to achieve finally substantial cuts in NOx. Unfortunately, the cross-state uh, air pollution rule has been challenged in court, but I'm happy to say that just two weeks ago, the United States Supreme Court has announced that it will review that challenge and I hope the Supreme Court overturns the very misguided lower court decision and restores uh, those clean air standards. Additional sulfur dioxides will come as a byproduct of the strong rules on mercury and air toxics that were adopted by EPA in 2011. Now earlier, um, EPA had been planning a very different mercury rule one that relied on emissions trading. As governor of Utah, Levitt had been pretty good on air pollution, very good, I'd have to say. Um, now, despite the fact that the Environmental Defense Fund has been an advocate for emissions trading for non-toxic conventional air pollutants, I guess we could say they're toxic too, can't we? Um, I was called in uh, to meet with the then EPA administrator, former Governor Levitt, and I told him in no uncertain terms that you can't use trading for a substance like mercury. He didn't listen to me. Hubbard Brook to the rescue. 
Um, thanks in part to the work of Charlie Driscoll and Kathy Lambert, uh, EPA did adopt a strong mercury rule um, without trading because their work documented that there were hot spots associated with power plants and other big sources of mercury. So with both acid rain and mercury, it's clear that science can spur needed public policy. Now on climate, as I said, we haven't made as much progress, not nearly enough, but we are beginning to see action. Just three weeks ago in the Chinese city of Shenzhen, near Hong Kong, it lost it, it launched its carbon trading program. China's seven pilots, by the way, pilots, what's a pilot? Well, these seven pilots are an area of China where 230 million people live. It's a significant swath of China. And of course, two weeks ago here in Washington, um, President Obama announced an ambitious plan to tackle climate change that will move forward if there's enough public support. Science has also spurred corporate action. Eight years ago, I was with uh, Hank Parker when he showed Lee Scott, the then CEO of Walmart, some of the extended Hubbard Brook long-term forest plots. It was Hubbard Brook science that framed our conversation both there in Compton and later that evening at the summit of Mount Washington. There at the top of that mountain, Steve Hamburg spoke about the impacts of global warming as revealed through the records of Herbert Brook. Lee Scott accepted the science and asked questions about the impact on the company and on his customers. And since then, Walmart has acted. In fact, when President Obama gave his speech a couple of weeks ago, he commended Walmart noting that the company is committed to cut its carbon footprint by 20% and transition completely to renewable energy. But think about it, the president said. Would the biggest retailer in America really do that if it weren't good for business, if it weren't good for their shareholders, he asked. Well, at EDF, we found if you want to move America, Sure helps if you can move American business. And to think that Walmart's leadership on climate may have taken root right here at Hubbard Brook. The Hubbard Brook story should give us the confidence that it is still in our power to turn back the tide of greenhouse gas emissions. We just have to move a lot faster and get ahead of the problem. In the age of the internet, science can be communicated as never before. We can visually display the big sources of where carbon and where methane are being emitted. Ubiquitous pollution sensors connected to the internet can paint a clear and detailed picture. We can alert people to um, what is the data and social networks can spread that data and also the news of where the opportunities are for action. But we must stay true to the science. For certain impacts, heat waves, torrential rains, droughts, the climate change connections are clear. But some are tempted to stray from the science. When an asteroid closely approached Earth in February, a CNN anchor asked Bill Nye was this caused by climate change? <laughs> Last week, I was being interviewed on a nationwide radio talk show with a progressive anchor, and she matter-of-factly stated that we're having more earthquakes because of climate change. So I matter-of-factly corrected her. We must not be tempted to misrepresent the science uh, what we know and what we don't know about tornadoes and, and hurricanes. Misstating the science undermines credibility. We can make a bulletproof case that action is needed now by sticking to what we know. And being rational in tone not only means being scientifically correct, it also means capturing the center and avoiding a partisan agenda. 
Of course, when trumped up fraudulent science is rolled out by those with a vested interest in the status quo, we need to call that out. As Jeff Nesbitt did 20 years ago as an associate commissioner of FDA when he was facing the so-called tobacco scientists. Today, Jeff is working for Climate Nexus and challenging the deceptive claims of what he calls the notorious deny the science propaganda think tanks and hired guns. <clears throat> but we also need to understand that there are many who perhaps haven't had the time to be educated about climate science and who need to be. Some are looking for advice on climate from leaders who share their own political worldview. Since Senator John McCain exited the climate stage, there's been a scarcity of Republican opinion leaders expressing concern. So when a Republican leader like Senator Kelly Ayotte, who has been open to discussion on climate, raises legitimate issues about the impact of EPA regulations on the economy and jobs, those concerns need to be taken up and discussed, not shouted down. Where we can agree that there is a problem that needs to be solved, then we have the chance to collaborate on a solution. I'm confident that's possible if we're willing to have that conversation. In college, I had an engineering professor named Charlie Walker. He's a tall, soft-spoken Texan. And he taught me people can solve a lot more problems if we just lower our voices. The lesson for us as people who care about the environment is that we have to depolarize the politics surrounding the climate debate. We must engage more widely, listen more carefully, and be willing ourselves to find common ground. We must help common sense prevail. It all comes down to this. Science should lead to action. Here at Hubbard Brook, we've seen how science helped lead to action with acid rain, with mercury, and with Walmart. But it only happens if we engage others to act. Buckminster Fuller, the visionary who popularized the term Spaceship Earth, gave a speech late in his life at UMass Amherst. At the end of his lecture, there was wild applause, but he cut it off. This keeps happening. He complained to the crowd. I talk, people applaud, and then they go home. If you like what I said, go out and do something about it. It's an honor for me to be here at Hubbard Brook with people like you, who not only handle the truth, but do something about it every day. Thank you. So uh, there's time for questions. So with that last admonition, do something about it. He's got the. Now I must have said something that provoked somebody. There we go. Uh, first of all, Fred, I'm, my name is David Dickey. I'm with the Nature Conservancy, for, and thank you very much for your terrific leadership on the issue of climate in our federal legislature, the, the, the U.S. Congress. We all owe you a big debt. And thank you for mentioning Bucky Fuller, by the way. I'm married to his niece. <laughs> <laughs> My question, I guess, is that we, had, we made a huge run at getting um, cap and trade in the Congress, and it failed. Um, isn't it time that we recognize that organizations like TNC and EDF and wonderful scientists are making their case, they're making it um, very forcefully, and yet we're not being heard in the halls of Congress. Um, shouldn't we be 
talking about why not and whether there's some kind of reform that we could back that would make the Congress um, more responsive to our membership, to reason, to science, to all the things that uh, they have um, responded to in the past but are seemingly uh, are, are completely deaf to now. I mean, it's, it's, the President's speech was terrific, but I, I personally don't think that um, we can do what needs to be done solely from the administration side. You'd agree with that. I mean, the legislature matters. It's definitely essential. Yeah, no, we can, we're not going to solve the climate change problem or America's contribution to it without getting Congress involved. And you're absolutely right. We, we, should, um, we should let the, uh, <laughs> let the folks in. Um, we, we, should, um, we should absolutely be discussing what sort of electoral reform, campaign finance reform, wh whatever the ideas are to make um, Congress more responsive. But in the meantime, uh, we've got to do everything we can to get action now. So we have to lay the groundwork for the next time we have a window that opens, as we did a few years ago. We just didn't convert. We have to make sure next time there's a window for action, um, not only do we convert, but we bring that window on quicker. But in the meantime, I think it's, it's a great idea to support President Obama's call for the first ever carbon standards for existing power plants. Um, and I, he can get that done in his term, and that can take a big slice out of carbon emissions. It turns out, Steve educated to me a few years ago. Steve educated me a few years ago. Obviously, didn't do a very good job. <laughs> um, to the fact that uh, short-lived climate forcers, which I've taken to call accelerants, are a significant part of our near-term problem as much as 40% of the impacts, the incremental warming that we'll see from today's emissions over the next two decades, as much as 40% globally are from methane, black carbon, and um, hydrofluorocarbons. And methane is the biggest source um, in the United States, and the biggest source of methane in the United States is oil and gas operations. There's no excuse. Um, whether we should be drilling more or less here or there, we can debate that. But in the meantime, where we're drilling, drilling a hell of a lot of places, there's no excuse for this gas to be thrown into the atmosphere. In some cases, intentionally vent vented, in other cases, inadvertently. It is an incredibly potent climate forcer. And we can cut off some of the peaks and temperatures that we'd otherwise experience in the next two decades by getting after these short-lived forcers. We absolutely have to be doing everything we can to reduce carbon emissions as well. But we've got to get after these short-lived forcers. So I, th I think there are things that the administration can do both on power plants and on methane. And we've got to make another run in co at Congress, I hope, sooner rather than later. I thought my days of asking questions at Hubbard Road meetings were over, but I guess not. Uh, they never end. <laughs> Jane pointed out that here at Hubbard Brook, the nitrate levels in the, the nitrate input has been going down quite fast and, and quite a lot. But you're saying that the nitrate emission control hasn't really happened very much. So why this discrepancy? Uh, well, Jane might want to get into answering yeah, this <laughs> I think we've seen nitrogen levels go down, what, 30% in the last few years, something like that, but not that much before then. And 30% compared to sulfur is 80%. I'm just saying, Gene taught me, we're not calling it solved till it's solved. <laughs> and we, we need to take a much bigger bite out of nitrogen. Yeah. Um, there's a strong correlation. Could you stand up, Gene? Sorry. Just okay. There's a strong correlation with uh, the decline in NOx emissions, which Fred talked about, and this recent decline in uh, nitrogen precipitation that we're seeing. There's a strong correlation there. So when, when those NOx emissions started to decline, which they have, but not nearly as much as sulfur, <coughs> the nitrate follows. So there's a very tight correlation, a statistical correlation between the two. It just it's a relative question, right? How much? And the point is that, comparatively speaking, uh, nitrogen has gone down much less than sulfur, and there's a lot, there's still a lot more anthropogenic nitrogen coming into the system than there was historically. Uh, 
going into controversy, if we can convert coal plants to gas plants, which we are apparently, there's a tremendous environmental improvement. So that leads me to fracking. Do you believe the fracking done well, controlled methane is all right, or it's inherently bad? Or is it just sloppy drilling that causes fracking problems? That's the question. <laughs> Why don't you restate it? You get to reframe it if you want. The uh, question is, is, is fracking and using natural gas inherently bad or can it be done right? And uh, can you let the next speaker know there's been about an hour delay here? Okay. <laughs> uh, the, short, the short answer is um, there are places, in my view, where fracking should not be allowed sensitive ecosystems, places where the aquifer is um, too close to the shale. Um, there are a lot of places where fracking is happening now where it's not being done right. We've had literally thousands of violations. Unlike offshore drilling where there's only a few companies, onshore we have 2,000 companies doing it and the standards and the regulations that need to be in place aren't. Recently, um, the 13, 14 states where 85% of our onshore gas is produced, recently those states have begun to tighten up their standards in re response to community outrage. Uh, industry has exacerbated the controversy by denying that there are problems when the problems are apparent. My view is um, a lot of fracking is going to continue to happen. 90% of all oil and gas wells are fracked. We've got to protect the people now who are living around those wells and we've got to protect the atmosphere. So living in some world where it's going to stop on the dime, uh, I think shirks responsibility to the neighbors all across America, in Oklahoma and Texas, uh, where you're not going to see fracking stop. We've got to put strong regulations in place. Every coal plant you take out with natural gas is an improvement in carbon emissions. But if the methane emissions are too high, it, can be, it could be worse for the atmosphere. So the second thing we have to do when we know that fracking is going to continue is we have to drive methane pollution down to near zero. And the third thing is we shouldn't allow any new natural gas plants to be built if it's going to you know, replace solar or wind or truly carbon-free sources. We've got to do everything we can to bring on those sources. Given the paralysis in Congress, how do we do that? EDF is launching a big effort in nine states how do we pick the nine states? We pick the nine states that add up to half of our electricity. And in those nine states, we're going to go in there and fight for reform of the Public Utility Commission, the state commissions that govern what sources are dispatched. In New Jersey, where I grew up, down the street from where my mom and dad were living during a recent hurricane, or Superstorm San Sandy, I should say, to be precise, their power went out for two weeks. Down the street there was somebody living with solar cells on the roof. Neighbors you know, went by uh, her house, congratulated her on her wisdom and foresight until she explained that every solar cell in New Jersey was going out too because the system was poorly engineered and designed. We need to change those rules. And then there will be a lot more incentives for people. That's just one example. There's a lot of examples of rules that we could bring in uh, truly clean sources now, and we've got to do that and not just rely on this glut of natural gas that we have to generate power. I'm just going to leave a couple I more questions one, here, but I just... One sorry. follow up if possible. Okay. I think I heard you say there are geologies where you just shouldn't frack. Correct. And, and, but implied in that, when the geologies are all right, if you properly regulate, and guard it, it would be fine. It isn't inherently bad in the correct geologies with proper regulation. Is that what you said? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I'm trying to hear you. Yeah. The, I would say, you know, in my view, I'm a big home rule guy. 
communities should be able to say yes or no based on their values. The state should also have minimum standards. But if a community wants to zone out this very industrial activity, I think that's fine. So um, I do think the risks can be contained with strong regulation. A lot of my friends, uh, and I do have friends in the business community, they stop there. But you know what? Just saying that in some theoretical universe the risks can be contained and not lifting a finger to get strong rules in place, um, that's unacceptable. They, the risks can be theoretically minimized. Communities still should be able to say no, but everyone has, in my view, in the business community and in the neighborhoods and in the states and in the environmental community, an obligation to work to put those regulations in place, not to stop the sentence that theoretically it can be done right. Because there isn't a state in the nation which has the right rules yet. And I just want to add one thing since Fred uh, didn't. Um, and that's that uh, Fred, in his talk, in his speech, um, talked about getting the science right. And in a conversation he and I had three years ago was that we didn't have the science to answer the question that you just presented. And so we designed the largest study in the country to answer that. We're working with 40 academics, and Fred's credit, he went out and raised the bulk of the money so that we, EDF is putting $10 million into a $15 million study, which is now starting to roll out the results with 40 academic partners, 40 corporate partners across the country looking at the entire natural gas supply chain and all the issues that you raise on the air side. And so it's not just rhetoric. Uh, I went to EDF and left academia because I have a boss who, excuse me, I have a boss who believes what you said. John, you had a question? I was, just, I was just wondering, the next time you have this window to talk to Congress, is it cap and trade or just carbon tax? What's the strategy? My criteria the next time we have the window is going to be anything that's sure to get carbon levels down. <laughs> it's not, ideological purity isn't my thing. It's results. Jane, we have a couple of time for it. We start a little late, so we'll give, go over a little bit. Fred, regulation is only half the equation. You can have the best regulations on the books, and if you don't have the resources and the people to enforce it and the fines, it'll stop people from breaking the regulations. They're not worth the paper. I right. agree with you. I mean, you and I both know as New Yorkers, you know, we have lots of regulations on the book. Somebody breaks it. They go and they find the person. The yeah. crime is so small, they pay it and go right back to what they're doing. Yeah, Jane is pointing out that regulation isn't enough. You need to actually have compliance. Um, in a lot of places, states don't have uh, the capacity to enforce the regulation. That, that's exactly true. I should have said that. I stand corrected. Compliance is the thing. And, you know, under the acid rain provisions, because we talked to a lot of different groups, uh, including NRDC, uh, we built into the acid rain provisions felony uh, liability for people that misstate what their emissions are. And sulfur dioxide provisions of the Clean Air Act are the best program EPA has ever run with near 100% compliance. And that's what we need to do. Good natural gas regulations are designed where company officials are certified, certifying under penalty of criminal conviction that they're complying. Good natural gas regulations like we can have in um, states that uh, allow drilling uh, would require 24-7 monitoring of methane release and posting that data on the internet, we can design good regulations that bring about compliance. But we don't have them yet. Any other? Yeah. Being a scientist from Germany, and you mentioned the EU, uh, I just would like to know what does the EU make better than the United States? Uh, the EU does a lot of things better than the United States. <laughs> The United States might do a few things better than the EU. We can learn from each other. But certainly, um, you know, I think the fact that the EU um, got going with carbon limits um, years ago I is better. The fact that they, you know, messed up the beginning of the cap and trade program is hardly ideal. But there's been a recent correction of that. 
The cap has been made more stringent. Prices of carbon have gone up. Um, so there's a lot to learn from the United States, from the EU, and vice versa. And there's things now we're going to learn from China, too. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.